Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Roger Kaza, and welcome to a world of horns. So great to see everyone for live music again. Now, whether you are watching online or live here in the beautiful Sheldon Concert Hall in St. Louis, Missouri, you probably came to hear music. And yes, I promise we will get to that. But before we do, I'd like to take a few minutes to talk about some of these interesting instruments here. You probably know this as the French horn, and indeed that is its full and proper name in the English language. But in orchestra world, it's often shortened to just horn. Now, claiming such a generic inclusive word like horn is very handy, for it allows us horn players to fancy ourselves connected to a distant mythic past of many different kinds of horns, as you see above. So let's start at the beginning and go way back in time, like into prehistory, a long ways back, when the word horn meant only one thing, and that's the horn of an animal. Now, this is a weird-looking horn which happens to come from an African antelope uh, known as the kudu. Here's what he might have looked like before he parted with his horns. Very impressive. Now, notice from the tip to the root, the part that would have been connected to his head, uh, it expands. It also has a very cool spiral shape. And uh, it turns out that the natural world is quite fond of these expanding spiral forms. It's sort of a, a cosmic signature, a logo, if you will. There's endless examples of these spirals. And if you really want to go down a rabbit hole, if you Google Fibonacci series, the golden mean, patterns in nature, you know, spirals, uh, to me, they sort of rule the cosmos. And here we have a, a perfect example. Now, people who study these matters believe that humans have been playing different sorts of horns for thousands, maybe tens of thousands of years all over the world. They theorize that the first horns were used simply as megaphones, like, ooh. But at some point, instead of talking through the horn, some genius thought to buzz their lips. In my imagining, it was probably a little boy or a little girl that was goofing around with the uh, grown-up's megaphone. And they made a goofy buzz with their, sa with their chops, their lips, and something amazing happened. The horn spoke back. Now, imagine how incredible that would be to hear for the very first time pitches like that. You know, it, we take pitches for granted. In 2021, there's music and tones everywhere. But back then, the only way you could make music was to make it yourself, singing it. Uh, so that must have been an amazing thing. Who knows what they thought? Maybe they thought they were hearing the spirit of the animal talking to them. Maybe they thought they were hearing the spirit of their ancestors. You know, we really can't recreate that world, so we'll never know uh, what they thought. But it's pretty incredible. Now, just as I demonstrated, this horn spoke back on two different pitches, and only those two pitches. I can't just buzz any note I want and have it come out. It's not a kazoo, OK? Uh, this horn has definite opinions about what note it will play and what note it won't play. And it plays those specific notes because it tapers from small to big here. The physics create those two tones. If it were just a cylindrical tube, it would not play those pitches. And the remarkable thing is the actual notes this horn is playing. Listen carefully to these two pitches. They're a perfect fifth apart. I'll play those on my French horn here. Now, if you want any more examples of a perfect fifth, and then we're just talking about counting up from the bottom note to the top note. One, two, three, four, five. That's all we mean by fifth. Uh, think of a John Williams tune, because they all start with fifths. OK, now here's the incredible thing. Pretend, again, it's a very long time ago, and musical scales haven't been invented yet, so no one can sing any tunes, at least any tunes that we know and love. How would you create a scale? Well, here's the thing. 
I hope Peter doesn't mind, I'll play a few notes on the piano. If we start with that fifth here, and now I'm gonna do another fifth starting from the top note, and just do that four more times. Well, we haven't repeated any notes, and in fact, we've created all the notes we need for a major scale or a minor scale and several other kinds of scales. So I would submit to you that uh, these two tones that this humble antelope horn is playing and that may have been played tens of thousands of years ago, they're not just any old tones. They are the two tones which, well, can create all of music when you think about it. It's kind of the primal interval, and this is not uh, new news. The Greek philosopher slash mathematician Pythagoras discovered this all about 2,700 years ago. So we believe that horns were used ritualistically or in a religious or spiritual capacity by people over the world since time immemorial. In fact, uh, my Jewish friends here may recognize this uh, kudu antler horn, her horn, as uh, one of the shofars that's used in Jewish services to this day. Now, this horn only has a couple of really good notes. What about a slightly bigger horn? Here's the so-called shepherd's horn, and I have a, a kind of a copy of it. As you can imagine, you can't just go to Walmart and get a shepherd's horn. They haven't been made in a long time. Now, we have remarkable stories from ancient writers who observed herders using specific shepherd horn calls to call each of the different herds who all knew which uh, call to respond to. Um, I'm going to buzz my lips a little bit higher and see if the horn plays any more notes than the kudu horn played. <laughs> Now, that has at least one more note, and some of you may recognize that call as the one Beethoven used in his pastoral symphony to evoke a bucolic landscape with a shepherd in the distance. Now, what about the darker side of humanity? Well, let's jump ahead to an age where the Romans were ruling the show. This is a Roman cornu, uh, which is the Latin word for horn. Think unicorn or cornucopia, the horn of plenty. And I have a modern replica here. Now, it's a bit longer than the kudu horn, so theoretically, it should play more notes. I really should be wearing a, a tunic to give you the, the full effect. <laughs> now, uh, it's got quite a few more notes than these other horns. These cornu were apparently stationed at the front of the Roman legions to basically translate the general's commands into loud calls that the centurions could understand, and of course, also to terrify the enemy. Now, here's a carving on the famous Trajan's column in Rome, if you've been there, of a bunch of them in formation. Now, the Romans weren't the only ones who used war horns. Here's one from the ancient Mayans. Okay, and our modern equivalent of ritual war might be pro sports, and it has a horn too. This vuvuzela uh, horn. Uh, it's used at soccer matches, it has exactly one good note. Okay. By the way, St. Louis is getting a pro soccer team in a couple years, so you'll definitely need one of these. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, now even though that Roman cornu sounds somewhat like a trumpet, I consider it an ancestor of the modern horn for two reasons. They were made of brass, which is the same metal we use today, and they got the curve thing going, which was kind of a revolutionary idea. Now, unfortunately, when the Roman Empire collapsed, so did all their knowledge of how to make these amazing brass musical instruments. 
So for the next thousand years or so, during the Middle Ages, we went back to short little horns made out of other materials that could only play a few notes. Some of them were very ornate, like this one made out of an elephant tusk. If you like medieval tapestries, you'll find horn players on them. And so this period begins kind of a fourth career for the horn. On top of its religious and pastoral and military uses, the horn now became a signaling instrument for all kinds of activities, but especially to assist in hunting. It's sort of appropriately ironic, isn't it, that a horn originally taken from a dead animal can now be used to assist in hastening another creature's demise. Uh, we humans are ruthlessly clever that way. But let's clarify, when we talk about hunting back then, uh, we're not talking about Bass Pro Shop or Cabela's. Th this is not blue collar hunting. This is not even white collar hunting. This is hunting strictly for the aristocracy. They were the only ones with the access to the forests and the horses and the dogs and basically the, the privilege to be able to hunt at all. And so Horn started going along for the ride. Here's a woodcut from 1350. Now, do you see these interesting rectangles at the top? We believe that's kind of a very primitive musical notation. And what we believe it's saying is the, uh, the white boxes are short notes and the dark boxes are long notes. So it, it comes out sounding like da 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 which is this galloping rhythm that sort of became a trope for the horn. In fact, you'll hear it in the Mozart concerto we play later, which was written 400 years later. Okay. So as the technology for brass instruments was rediscovered during the Renaissance, all sorts of trumpets and trombone instruments were invented, but I should say reinvented. No real curvy horn until the beginning of the 1600s. Here's one of the earliest depictions we have from 1615. And now we're really getting pretty close to an actual French horn. And at this point, a remarkable thing happened. We've noticed that the longer you make the horn, the more notes you can get out of it. For example, if I take my shepherd's horn, and I'm going to add a whole new section to it, and I'll just explain this horn a little bit. This, this horn was uh, designed by a, a Japanese horn player. He uh, designed it on a computer in a CAD program and then he sent the program to a 3D printer and literally it was printed out of biodegradable plastic so uh, horns meet high tech. Now I'm gonna play the lowest possible note I can I can get on this horn. It's kind of a squirrely note. Now uh, what happened? I'm going to play some notes and see if I can get any higher notes. There we go. That's the lowest note. Now, let me geek out for a minute here. What's happening here is that that lowest note is vibrating at a certain pitch, and the other notes on top of it are vibrating at exact multiples of that pitch. Say we called that lowest note 100, then the very next note would be 200. I'm talking about 100 vibrations a second. Then the next one would be 300. The next one would be 400. That perfect fifth that we heard on the antelope horn, it's on this horn too, it's just much, much lower. Now, uh, if this horn were transparent and you could see the wave, you'd see on that lowest note this super long wave going back and forth. And then on the upper notes, you'd see smaller waves. You'd see it divided in half, then you'd see it divided in thirds, you'd see it divided in quarters. So when people say music is math in sound, that's what they're talking about. Here's a chart that can kind of show you exactly what's happening with these waves. And again, they're all exact multiples of that lowest note. Here's a chart for anyone who reads music. You can see they start very far apart, and as they get higher and higher, they get closer and closer together. Now, there are horns similar to this green thing, Swiss Alp horns with their famous uh, Ricola commercial. Uh, the problem, of course, is the horn of this length is quite impractical to haul around and would be impossible to use hunting on horseback. But what if we just made it out of metal 
and just rolled it up a little like the old Roman cornu. And indeed, a few years later, in the middle of the 1600s, we see these rolled up horns in pictures of elaborate hunting parties at the court of Versailles. I'll zoom in now on the horn player. He's playing while riding, which that is quite a feat. Uh, now, I don't have this exact horn. Let me put this down for a second. But I do have one very similar. It's kind of a later model. And you can see it's just a big loop. They've looped the tubing around a few times. This is actually like 14 feet long. So you can play your call, and then you can put it over your shoulder and go back to riding. It's very, very convenient. <laughs> OK, so uh, this horn has no slides or valves. They've just taken the big loop and made those turns. But here's what's the cool thing about this horn. Since the longer we make it, the more notes we're going to get. When you make it this long, you'll actually get a whole scale in the higher range. And you can play tunes. Now, what happened during the court of Louis XIV, who was the king at the time, is that this, this horn became pretty much essential, both for the hunt and for all the pomp and pageantry that went with it. Now, I just played the horn in a rather gentle, a timid way, but now I would like to demonstrate uh, to the best of my abilities, and I'm no expert in this uh, instrument, how the French corps de chasse or trompe de chasse, the hunting horn, it might have sounded then. And this is based on an amateur tradition that lives on in France to this day. Now, you might want to have your fingers close to your ears. It's very, very loud. <laughs> Thank you. Now, there's, there's dozens of Trump calls, depending on what's happening during the hunt. Like, maybe we've uh, seen our quarry, or we're headed this direction, or we're stopping for lunch. They were like a giant one-way radio to keep a big spread-out hunting party in the loop of what was happening. Now, this whole tradition of hunting horns at Versailles might have remained like a local specialty, like brie cheese or something. But uh, history had other plans. And here's another picture of the hunting horns. Inter Count Anton von Spork from Bohemia, area around modern day Czechoslovakia, or Czech Republic. Now, he's much older in this picture, but when he was a teenager, he went on his obligatory grand tour of Europe, which was expected of any ambitious young man of the day. This would have been around 1680, which interestingly is, is almost the exact year that the French claimed the area where all gathered here, the Mississippi Valley. Uh, it's a very strange confluence of history. But uh, when he heard the hunting horns at Versailles, he apparently was so smitten with them, he decided he had to have some hunting horns for his own hunting parties back in Bohemia. So he left two of his valets in France to learn how to play the hunting horn. And when they came back to Bohemia, so the story goes, they were so good at it, and they taught so many others to be good at it, that the concert composers of the day, people like Handel and Bach and Vivaldi, uh, started to pay attention. And these composers gave a very cautious invitation to the hunting horn to perhaps join the orchestra, and, along with uh, indoors, with civilized instruments like violins and cellos. And so that is really how the horn joined the orchestra. Now, this horn would fit in the orchestra just fine as long as the music was in the key of D. But you see, I have absolutely no way of changing the pitch. It's just in one key. And that was a bit impractical, because a, a horn like that would cost a year's salary for a common laborer. It's, it's, what we needed is a horn that could play in different keys. And so then we came up with well, this idea, well, maybe we could make part of the horn detachable and have sections that add or subtract length. We call these crooks, and it's really a brilliant idea because now I can play in many different keys. Um, where's my mouthpiece here? 
So at this point, I would like to welcome our distinguished pianist for the evening, Peter Henderson. Peter, do you happen to know Bach's first Brandenburg Concerto? There's, there's the music for you in Bach's handwriting. Okay, now to me that sounds perfectly fine the way it is. It doesn't need anything else. And yet uh, Bach added something. He knew that his target audience was the aristocracy and that the hunt was a very big deal for them and that they had hunting horn players as part of their rich and famous lifestyle. Now, in the same way all of us know a few bugle calls like taps or reveille, these dukes and princes all knew individual horn calls and what they meant. Now, here's one that means basically good morning. <laughs> Okay, now if we just alter that a tiny bit, it goes perfectly with Bach's concerto. Let's try it, Peter. Okay, so it's like a little inside joke, a wink and a nod, that Bach knows who he's writing for. In this case, a patron he was cultivating, the wealthy Margrave of Brandenburg who, it turns out, didn't have musicians good enough to play Bach's amazingly complex music, so the score sat on a shelf for about a century until it was rediscovered. Now, at this point, we've come very, very close to the modern French horn. Here's another model copied after horns in the classical period, the time of Mozart and Beethoven. And I realize it doesn't look like my modern horn, but in spite of that, this horn can do 90% of what we need a horn to do. Um, and horn players discovered they could actually get even more notes than all those natural notes if they moved their hand in and out of the bell. Now granted, the tone changes a little bit when I move my hand. They considered that part of its charm, okay? Think of it as a very whole grain, high fiber sound with lots of roughage in it. So uh, as the horn starts its fifth and final career as a musical instrument, we're actually going to start the musical part of this program. We're going to do something a little bit different. Uh, Mozart wrote this jolly horn concerto with the galloping final movement, alluding to the hunting heritage, and including that rhythm, what we saw in that woodcut, da 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 First, I'll start on my modern horn, and then I'll switch to the old horn about halfway through, and I'll see what you think. Thank you. 
Okay, now, let's see if this plays here. I have a little brook up here of an Ozark Creek that I visited many, many times. Uh, it's kind of lead into this concept. Uh, Bach's name in German means brook, and it's an incredibly ironic title. This, this is a composer with, with an output like the Amazon River, and he was named Bach, or Brook, okay? Beethoven said it best. He said, uh, not a brook, but a sea should his name be. So we have some interesting Bach pieces that we've arranged for horn and synth organ here. The first one's a cello piece, so naturally I'll sit down for that one. <laughs> Get the water out of this thing. Thank you. 
Thank you.
you. Well, you may be a little sad that many of our toys have been taken off the stage. But we, we will try to make some beautiful music for you. And we begin with music of the very French and very representative of France composer, Gabriel Faure. He was known to be very talented as a very young boy. So he was sent to the Ecole Niedermeyer at the age of nine. And his intention was to study to be a church organist and choir director. He was very fortunate that one of the teachers there at that school was Camille Saint-Saëns, the very great French prodigy, incredible composer. And he and Saint-Saëns developed a really close relationship. Not only was Saint-Saëns a teacher and a mentor to Faure, but he became a lifelong friend. They knew one another for many decades, and they were very close. Indeed, actually, after graduating, Faure became Saint-Saëns' assistant as an organist at one of the main churches in Paris. And so he played very frequently because Saint-Saëns was touring a lot. And, but as his career developed, Faure developed a very common problem for musicians. He loved to compose. He really wanted to spend all his time composing. But in order to make a living, he had to do a number of other jobs. So he played piano, which he apparently preferred to organ. He also was uh, someone who was a teacher throughout his life, first a professor, and then he became eventually the director of the conservatory where he modernized the curriculum. The thing about Faure's musical style is that he marries kind of a Wagnerian chromaticism and intensity harmonically with a kind of elegance and the long line of Chopin and also a little bit of French reserve. And indeed, when he was on a composing retreat in Germany, he once said something to the effect that, well, I'm criticized a little bit because my music might be cold and maybe a little too careful and calculated. And he said, well, there is something to be said about the fact that being French is different from being German. So enjoy this French music.
lyrics to this song here.
So uh, during the COVID time, I spent a lot of time, as probably many of you did, doing other things. And one of the things I was doing was listening to music that I'd never heard before. I'd always heard Alma Mahler was an incredibly talented, gifted composer whose career was unfortunately <laughs> cut short when she married Gustav Mahler. He basically said, we can only have one composer in the household, and that's me. Uh, really unfortunate, because as a teen and in her early 20s, she wrote some just gorgeous songs. I think she wrote at least 50, maybe 100. Unfortunately, only 17 of them survive. And I encourage all of you to, to listen to them, because they're really gorgeous. They have this, this really overripe kind of uh, post-Wagnerian harmony that's just, just utterly gorgeous. You'll hear in, in Peter's part some really, really interesting chord changes. Uh, this is a song called in my, in my father's garden, in my father's garden, and I'll try to give you all the text. It's in a few pages here.
we have a very special piece coming up. It's never been heard before. It's a world premiere by the young composer Ben Dawson, and he's in the audience. And I wonder, Ben, if you could come down and say a few words about your piece. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I uh, just want to say it's been a fantastic night of music, and it's so nice to be in a house with a live audience again. It has uh, been way too long. Um, this piece uh, started in a very different place than where it ended. Uh, when I first got this commission a couple of months ago, um, I knew I wanted to do like an andante and rondo, so uh, just a slow lyrical movement followed by a like, more fast, upbeat kind of tempo, and I, I really wanted to play around with the idea of having the same melody um, for both of the movements, but just either reharmonized or uh, like simple, simple variation on them. And so I, I just, I really like the idea of it being like uh, two sides of the same coin. And as soon as I thought of two sides of the same coin, I thought of um, Janus, the Roman god of uh, doors, beginnings, uh, endings, the past, and the future. Uh, because the Romans had a coin, you know, it's, he's like the two headed god that you see on coins. Um, one head always looking to the past, one head also always looking to the future. And um, that's just that's how I write. Like I, I need a, I need a, a subject or a topic. Otherwise, I'm just uh, doodling. Um, and so, then I had the story. I had everything I needed. I need. Uh, I couldn't imagine uh, Janus being really just kind of boring. You know, like the the typical apathetic Roman god who uh, clocks in for their duties and then just walks away. Um, being the the god of beginnings and endings. Um, he's, you know, he's called for name days. So, like when you're born, he's called for birthdays, for anniversaries, for, um, and for death, you know, and for for a funeral. And so, I imagine like this is this is a god who sees you at all stages of your life. He he gets to know you. I would hope intimately. Again, I can't imagine just clocking in like nice birthday and walking away. Like I, at least for someone, there's got to be some type of a, a connection with this god. And so, um, then I thought. Well, he's the only one who has these, you know, these these interactions with people, um, and they're over. You know, he, he's he's got a he's got one face always looking backwards and one face always looking forward. But if he misses, you know, a lover, if he misses like a, a Tim, you know, uh, he's always looking back at Tim. He's always thinking about how great that time was. He's always thinking about um, the time that he can't get back. You know, in the, in the same token, um, the future and the excitement of of what's to come next, and. Uh, so that's the piece. It, it, it's, it, the Andante and Rondo is really a, a lament, or what I called a lament for the past and an ode to the future. Um, and it was as I was writing the program notes in like late March, April, that I realized um, it has nothing to do with Janice. <laughs> um, it has everything to do with me. Um, these past 18 months have been a very interesting and trying time for us all. And um, this is my last year at, at Mizzou. This is my victory lap. And for... I, th as we all did, I had a number of projects lined up, like a couple of things I was pretty excited for, and like a couple of my friends moved downtown, and like the <laughs> the last remnant of our friend group uh, could have had a interesting time uh, this last year, and that was all just swept under the rug because COVID. Um, and while while I was I was I was mourning what I said in, in program notes, I was mourning a bunch of endings. Um, I cannot help but be ecstatic for a bunch of beginnings. Like I, I have a music degree that I get to use now. That is the coolest thing to me. Uh, I'm so excited to do stuff with, with, with the degree. And th the piece is really it is my lament for the past. It is my ode to the future. It is. I was this whole year. I've been so saddened, but also so energetic and excited and ecstatic for what's what's to come. And that's just. Both, you know, two sides of the same coin, uh, and I had to talk about both. So, God of Doors is the sad side of this year, and also the exciting, uh, my excitement for things to come.
know, one of the most common questions symphony players get is, what is it like working with conductors? And uh, to borrow some dating lingo, I would say, it's complicated. <laughs> uh, we have a love-hate relationship with them. The bad ones can make you want to quit music altogether, and the truly great ones can elicit something close to a transcendental experience It's very hard to describe. The vast majority of conductors are somewhere in the middle of those two extremes. Now, I've done some conducting myself, and I, I grudgingly can see it's much harder than it looks uh, to, to really know what you're doing. Um, so I thought it'd be interesting to talk about a few conductors that I've had the privilege of working with over the years. Now, I've played for all but the first two of these conductors on this list, but I included them for reasons forthcoming. This is Fritz Reiner, conductor of the Chicago Symphony in the 1950s and early 60s. He had a very tiny beat, so small that a bass player once brought a telescope to work. <laughs> now, Reiner died before I was, even knew what a French horn was, but I heard all about him from two of my teachers, Philip Farkas and Christopher Luba, who played first horn for him in Chicago. He was known to quietly terrorize Players. There was almost no union protection in those days for musicians. So if you got the V sign from Reiner during a concert, he'd just given you your two weeks' notice. Um, Reiner also taught conducting, and Leonard Bernstein was probably his most famous pupil. Now here is George Zell. At 11 years old, he toured Europe as a pianist and a composer and was hailed as the next Mozart. As a teen, he worked with the composer Richard Strauss, who was very impressed and let him record some of his works. In the mid-1940s, Zell made what might have been considered a strange career move. He went to the relatively quiet town of Cleveland, Ohio, and told the board of the symphony there if they gave him basically dictatorial powers, he would create for them one of the greatest orchestras in the world. And the amazing thing is, he did exactly that. He's been gone for 50 years, but the orchestra is still very highly regarded. Now, let me tell you an anecdote so you can get a clue of Zell's personality. Apparently, the Cleveland Indians had won the World Series, and the players were incredibly excited. So during rehearsal, they said, hey, when he gives a downbeat, we'll play, take me out to the ball game. So they did exactly that. And an alarm look crossed Zell's face, and he went, no, no, Mahler, Mahler. And so the joke was a complete dud. And later, a, a reporter asked him, Maestro, couldn't you just shot a little team spirit and laughed along? Because, well, I would have, but they played so poorly I didn't recognize the tune. <laughs> <laughs> That's the kind of gaslighting that we have to deal with. Uh, I was lucky enough to hear one of his last concerts live, and I got to know them through the amazing Cleveland Orchestra recordings, which are highly recommended if you haven't heard them. They just have an incredible vigor to them. This is Eugene Ormandy. He had an astounding 44 years at the helm of the Philadelphia Orchestra. Can you imagine having a president for that long? Uh, he recorded the standard repertoire at least three times over. He had a huge influence on me uh, as a kid when he'd bring his fabulous Philadelphians to my hometown of Portland, Oregon, which had an okay orchestra at the time, but nothing like Philadelphia. Later, he came to guest conduct in St. Louis and was apparently quite fond of our orchestra here. He was an enigmatic little man who put a polished sheen on all music, whether it required it or not. Definitely has the record for longevity. This is Zantol Daurati, who conducted the uh, Minneapolis, Detroit, and National Symphonies. He's a hero of mine because uh, he was the first conductor to record all 104 of Haydn's symphonies. And so John Schulte, Reiner's successor in Chicago, who really put a distinctive stamp on that orchestra with incredibly dynamic performances and a very aggressive brass section. Now, he only came here once, as far as I recall, but it was incredibly memorable. We had just one rehearsal with him, and in that one rehearsal, he somehow changed the entire sound of the St. Louis Symphony, so it more closely resembled what he was used to in Chicago. I, I don't know how he did it. It was, it was uncanny. I asked my colleague Jacques Izraelovich, who was 
our concert master at the time, what he thought of Schulte. He, he'd worked with him a lot in Chicago. He kind of glibly said, well, he is king of loud and fast. <laughs> that and a lot more. Now, the astounding thing about these first five conductors, who had such an enormous influence on the American classical music scene over a 50-year period, is that all five hail from a tiny Central European country with a population not much bigger than Missouri, namely Hungary. And this fact was drilled into me from a very early age by another Hungarian-American conductor whom I knew quite well, namely my father, Eugene Kaza, who was also a conductor. Now, it was a thrill for me to join him and my brother. Uh, after a St. Louis Symphony tour, we drove over to Hungary his childhood mother tongue came back. He was conversing with the natives and also jamming on violin at the cafes with the, with the bands. 25 years later, I repeated that memorable trip with my oldest daughter, Jocelyn, and I hope to go back with my younger daughter, Amelia. If you have not been, I urge you to visit Hungary. It's an incredibly beautiful country. Now, Leonard Bernstein obviously needs no introduction. He's indisputably the greatest American classical musician in the second half of the 20th century. He's been gone 30 years, but really no one has stepped into his shoes. He was a conductor, composer, pianist, educator, music evangelist. He could do it all, and he did. Now, many of us boomers got to know him at Tanglewood Festival in Massachusetts, where there's a student orchestra where Bernstein actually got his own start. Uh, one of my most memorable experiences with him was as a uh, composer rather than a conductor. He'd written an interesting work called Divertimento for Orchestra for the Boston Symphony. We were doing the world premiere, and it had a tricky muted horn part in one of the movements. For some reason, he wasn't satisfied with the muted sound. And so I suggested uh, we could do like I did in the Mozart, where you cram your hand all the way in the bell. We call it stop horn. And I played it for him, and he liked it. So uh, I immediately regretted my suggestion because it made the solo about 10 times harder. But uh, I, I dutifully wrote it in the part, because these are the brand new parts. And for some reason, I wrote it in French. I don't know why I did to this day. I wrote Boucher, which means covered, and I wrote Cuivre, which means brassy. And the postscript of this story is about 20 years later, the piece came back with all new parts. And I was thrilled to see that my pencil and markings are now officially printed in the score <laughs> in French. So uh, that's my little tiny contribution to Leonard Bernstein's amazing legacy. Now, include these two as a pair to relate a very funny incident. The guy on the left is Charles Dutrois, a Swiss conductor who had a distinguished career with the Montreal Symphony, and he was renowned as an interpreter of French music. We were doing Ravel's Daphnis and Chloe, and he wanted a kind of obscure horn passage really loud. So I played it that way, and he was happy. Now, a few months later, we're performing the exact same piece with André Previn, the jazz pianist and composer turned conductor, on the right. And I was all excited since Dutrois had taught me correct way to play this little excerpt. So I, naturally, I did it exactly the same way, really loud. Whereupon Previn stops the entire orchestra and says to me, you've got to be kidding. <laughs> so, different strokes for different folks. It's, uh, you can't please them all. Christoph Eschenbach had an incredible personal story. He was born in Germany in 1940, just as the war started raging. His mother died giving birth to him, and his dad was basically sent off on a suicide mission by the Nazis. Uh, he contracted typhus. He was raised in a typhus camp. He was apparently so traumatized by all these events, he was mute for an entire year. Eventually, a kindly aunt took him on, and she had a piano, which became his salvation. He had this little private universe of beauty amidst all the chaos and destruction. He conducted in Philly and in Washington, D.C., but I think his greatest success was probably with the Houston Symphony where I was lucky enough to work with him. Now, this guy, Kurt Mazur, is a very serious East German conductor. And he was so popular in his home country that he was being encouraged to run for president. And this was right before the two Germanys reunited. But he also got an offer at the same time to become music director of New York Philharmonic. And his colleague, the young Simon Rattle, who had had some experience with American orchestras, they gave him some sage advice. He said, Kurt, just be sure you understand which job is going to be harder. And uh, in spite of that, he took the New York Philharmonic job. He was quite successful there. 
John Williams. I got to work with him in the Pops in my 20s, then again just in 2019 when he came here for a special concert, some of you may have seen. Uh, just an amazing human being. He's probably the richest composer who ever lived, but he's also incredibly generous with his music. Rather than renting it out for an exorbitant fee, he just publishes it for anyone to buy and perform, and almost every orchestra does that to the great benefit of their bottom line. Um, this concert here at 29 Eden, it was like a rock concert. I've never seen such energy. The, the tickets sold out in an hour. We walked on stage to thunderous applause. Um, it was a thrill to see him again. Here he is with our horn section. Now, lest you think conductors are 100% white males, often Hungarian, uh, slowly but surely there's been a move towards diversity in the field. For example, my first two bosses were Japanese, Kazuyoshi Akiyama and Seiji Ozawa, but very similar conductors in some ways. They both had the same brilliant teacher in Japan. It's a graceful, kind of physical, expressive approach. Now, neither of them spoke English very well, but with them it didn't matter because they had such incredibly uh, expressive gestures, you could figure out exactly what they wanted. This is uh, Gustavo Dudamel, the LA Phil. He's probably the hottest conductor out there now. He came from the El Sistema system in Venezuela, which is a free socialized music education. It takes in these poorest kids from the barrios and gives them a daily uh, music education. And he thrived in that environment. A lot, like a lot of these conductors, he has a photographic memory and he conducts most works without a score. This is James DePriest. Probably the most successful black conductor. He also had an amazing personal story. He was stricken with polio in his 20s, and he used crutches to get to the podium. But once he got there, it was a huge commanding presence. Uh, he also wrote poetry. He built the organ symphony, and I saw him develop this uh, to really a world-class orchestra. And he guest conducted many major orchestras, including us, many times. Joanne Folletta is, was the first woman to become music director of a major orchestra, the Buffalo Philharmonic. Uh, she also has a terrific radio show called Living American. If you subscribe to Sirius Radio, check out her show. It's really fantastic. She picks all these American composers to focus on. We ought to bring her here more often. And our own Gemma New, uh, she is a superstar in the making. We were so lucky to have her here for the last few years. You can all say we knew her way back when. Uh, I've heard that even though she's not here officially, she's going to be coming back one week a year, so do not miss her concerts. Now, I want to wrap up this little interlude with a few of my favorite conductors. This is Sir Colin Davis, English conductor, and just a true mensch. He had the, the gravitas, the charm, the uh, psychological insight that you need nowadays to get players to play their best. Those scary old days of Fritz Reiner and George Zell, they're, they're long gone, okay? Um, he's a leader of the new school of conducting using persuasion rather than intimidation. Claudio Obato, just one of the greats of the last 50 years. When the Berlin Philharmonic players chose him to be their new music director in 1989, it was a considered a sign of the new, the times, the new globalization, that uh, in Berlin, of all places, uh, they would choose an Italian over a native German. Now, I only played on him once, and they were extremely trying circumstances. Uh, I had a terrible case of the flu, and I missed all of the rehearsals. So the first time I saw him, was at the concert. Uh, we were doing Mahler's Third, which has a bit of horn, and we were taking it to Carnegie Hall, so <laughs> it was dicey. Uh, it was kind of a blur. Now, it goes without saying that these two guys are on the list, Leonard Slatkin and David Robertson, even if they weren't terrific conductors, which they are, I would be eternally grateful to them for bringing me to St. Louis at two different times in my life and gainfully employing me so I can put my kids through college and live in this great town. And last but not least, uh, in this city founded by the French, gave us, among other gifts, the French horn. Uh, and we at long last had a French conductor leading the St. Louis Symphony, Stéphane Benet. Uh, so I hope after this awful interlude of COVID, you guys come back to the symphony and check out our concerts in the fall because there's some really very exciting so uh, we're almost at the finish line here, and I want to just remind everyone there will be a reception out in the atrium, so please stick around and stay high. We'd love to see you. Now, by now you might realize that almost all the works on this program 
uh, with the exception of the Mozart and Mr. Dawson's work, were originally written for other instruments. Okay, we've done a concert of covers, so to speak. Uh, this bar talk is no exception. It's originally a violin work, and I hope my violinist friends will forgive me for appropriating it. Uh, he also transcribed it for cello, and so that's kind of in the same range as the French horn, so I thought it might work on horn. Now we're having this big conversation these days about cultural appropriation, and Peter and I were talking about Bartok, and he pointed out that Bartok not only appropriated folk music, especially folk music of the Romani peoples, but in doing so, he helped preserve all this music, which might otherwise have been lost. Okay, and while most composers tend to sort of beautify or smooth out the rough edges when they incorporate folk music, uh, Bartok, to me, seems to do exactly the opposite. There are some strange and very dissonant chords in the piano, which no folk band would ever use, but yet to me, they bring out the, the strangeness and the otherness of this lost musical world in a, an evocative and very effective way. So uh, thank you for coming, and please enjoy our rendition of Bartok's first rhapsody. Thank you. 